Hi, welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, strategies, and tactics they use to run great organizations. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Hope Troy. Hope is a marketing strategist and founder of HopeWorks Design. She helps small to mid-sized firms design modern marketing strategies to attract the clients they want. Very excited. This should be a pretty fun and insightful conversation with a lot of uh, cool takeaways. Uh, Thank you so much, Hope, for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So I'm very uh, curious about how you got started into marketing to kind of set the stage. Uh, I take it that you you studied architecture Mm -hmm. in school. Yeah, um, I studied architecture at Cornell and um, I, you know, had set my sights on becoming an architect since I was a small child and uh, someone someone put the idea in my head because I was always, you know, playing with Legos, building blocks, um, drawing houses, and I didn't know at the time that you could get paid to do that. <laughs> so um, once, I, once I discovered the world of architecture, I was pretty set on becoming one. Um, and yeah, it was great. Everything was going well. And then the recession happened. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, the interesting thing though, was that the entire time, like while I was in school, um, studying architecture, I was also taking classes in um, graphic design, web design, and marketing mm. um, because those were just interests. I, you know, I wasn't thinking so far down the line of like, oh, I'll need to know these skills for my own firm. I hadn't really made that connection. It was just a, a genuine interest. Um, but once the recession happened, uh, I needed to pivot. And while I could have stayed within architecture or practicing architecture, and that was my first priority or prerogative, but um, I realized that there was a real need for marketing. And I realized that I didn't learn anything about that within my, like Mm. the actual like architect, like I went out of my way to learn these things. It was not within the curriculum of architecture school. And that kind of, you know, set in motion this whole thing of, um, well, let's let's do that. Let's plug that hole and let's help educate so that, you know, architecture firms are not quite so uh, susceptible to mm. recessions. Yeah, and, and since, since then, I think that you're referring to 08, 09, mm-hmm. right? Um, since then, the landscape of marketing has evolved significantly. I'm very curious, what are the, the things that you're, that are sort of very top of mind to you at this point? Um, having seen that landscape evolve, like what, what are the, the questions you get asked frequently? Let's start mm-hmm. there. Yeah, um, lately it's been um, <laughs> kind of a, a grab bag of, of questions, but um, lots of questions about social media. Mm. like the purpose of it, what exactly you're supposed to use it for in terms of, you know, attracting clients? Like, what does that mean? Um, there's lots of, there's lots of um, information, there's lots of articles that talk up the importance of being on social media, of sharing, you know, your work on social media, but how do you go from sharing a post to getting a client and is that how it works? So questions mm-hmm. within that realm of things. And then also um, questions about the rest of digital marketing. So, you know, do I need to have an email list and what am I gonna send people? Like, why, why mm-hmm. do I need to have this? Um, you know, because there's such a long um, client journey or the journey to becoming a client, like there's a long process, a lead process from a prospect to someone signing a contract and becoming your client. So how do you know um, what you should be doing? Like, should you, uh, should you be you know, reaching out to people directly on LinkedIn? Should you be sending out a newsletter, um, you know, with, um, you know, just about project details? Like, hmm. what, what, what do you do with it? And then on the other side, like, do you need to, be paying for ads is that something you should be investing in do you need to be on all the social media can you just stick Mm. to one platform um 
So clearly oh. a, a, a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah. a lot of it surrounds like the social media part of it, because I think yeah. by now, at least for um, what I've been seeing, everyone understands the importance of a website. And that yeah. is not just a brochure, it's not just to show off your projects, like it should be a place for people to find information and a place that can um, capture some of these leads, some of these interested mm. people so they can contact you, right? So while that's still something I, I help educate people about, uh, the majority of the questions is, else is off the website. It's getting people to that website. And what do you do with them? <laughs> once, mm. once you've attracted these people, they're not quite ready to engage you yet, but you wanna, you wanna make sure that you know, you stay top of mind. So when they are ready to engage, yeah. they will choose you over another firm. So in, in talking about, um, you know, the, the, let's say the audience that the, let's say your clients are trying to attract, right? Because ultimately a lot of what ooh, you're, you're touching upon a lot of different channels, let's say, right. Mm -hmm. In which you can attract or build help to build an audience. Um, social media being a sort of a blanket term for a lot of different places where that can happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very curious about the like where where would you where, where would one even start ultimately right because there's I mean we're talking a little bit about audience and, and and these different channels but if if you had to talk to let's say a two person firm three person mm -hmm. five person firm like where would be the the things that they need to first understand about themselves maybe even mm -hmm. before they can start even tackling those different areas. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of, um, of I guess you could say like prep work before you jump into this, this deep pool of mm -hmm. online marketing. Um, one of those things is um, you need to have your messaging. You need to understand the mission behind your firm. Um, and it needs to be clear. It can't just be some vague notion that you feel is right you need to be able to clearly and succinctly communicate that to someone else that has no idea of anything about your brand or your business mm -hmm. and make that clear to them. Cause that's when, that's when, you know, you're on the right track. If you can very quickly um, get that across to someone that doesn't know you or your business. Um, and, and messaging can take a while to get the hang of. So right. it's, it's, not, it's not something you can just think about for five minutes and write a paragraph and you're done. Like you really it's need to dialogue. think about that. Yeah. yeah, it's a dialogue, yeah. yeah. And then, um, and, that, and that's, I mean, if you start there, the clearer picture you have of who you are or who your firm is um, as a brand, the easier it will be to know um, who your target audience are, who are the people you wanna attract. Because just because someone might have a project that um, you know is several million dollars and it's in the right location and it's the type of project that you love, if you hate the client, it's going to be horrible. <laughs> like working, yeah. so you need to attract people that you want to be with. Like business is really about people, so you need to kind of, if you have your mission um, clearly stated, and that is, you know, just resonant through all of your various marketing collateral, um, you will attract people that vibe with you, that mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. like, you know, um, understand your message and want to get, can get behind it because they share it. So they yeah. share your value system. Um, so that's, that's key. You want to, you want to get that because you don't want to jump into social media, do a lot of this work, build up a huge following, but there are following of people that aren't right for right. what, where you want to go as a company. Um, but once you have your messaging down, the other thing is uh, you need to have your operations like buttoned up. Like you need to know, um, you know, you need to be keeping track of where you're spending your time, where your partners are spending their time, where any of your employees, um, whether they're full-time or part-time or contractors, where they're spending their time. You need to make sure that you know exactly how much money you have available to invest into marketing. So once you have that messaging down and you're sure and everyone in your firm is behind it, like there's this unity, um, you need to make sure you've got the operation side buttoned up. 
Um, but once you have an idea of what you have to work with in terms of budget for investing into your marketing activities, once you have a clear idea about the branding of your firm, the messaging of your firm, and what you stand for as a firm, it's, it's just so much easier. It's like, okay, well, you know what? Um, it's easier to find our people because our people are similar to us. They, yeah. you know, they, res they, they, we, you will also resonate with what they share online as well. And you will know where they are online. So, you know, it might be that you spend more time on LinkedIn because that's where your people are. Or you spend more time on uh, Instagram because that's where your people are. Yeah. And you also will know what types of messages you should be putting out because one, you're, everything you put out should be a reflection of who you are as a firm. And then that's going to attract people that you know, are on that same wavelength. And you're gonna, you know, and they're going to share your content and attract even more people. And you just slowly, you will build up an audience of these like-minded fans. Um, and that's just where you start. So do the, do the behind the scenes work. Mm -hmm. And it'll be so much easier. Everything else will be so much easier. Yeah, this, this, uh, there's a lot of noise out there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what you're describing is like, how do you, how do you get, how do you create signal with, through that noise so that people can really um, either know where to find you or when they do come across you, it's very clear to them like, oh, there's this, this firm or uh, this person even. I mean, I, we can talk a little bit about sort of personal brands and, and how that affects things today. But um, that there's something there that you really resonate with. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when we talk about like, um, you know, finding that audience, you know, let's, in terms of LinkedIn, right? Like LinkedIn would be a place where it's, it's really where people go to talk about business, right? right. Ultimately, it's about your, the, your professional self, your career oriented self. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily where you um, share the same things that you would share on Instagram necessarily, just because it's a very different context. Mm -hmm. And so the people that you might be, or the, the potential clients you might be looking for um, in LinkedIn could be more commercial oriented, could be commercial real estate. It could be, um, you know, if, if you want to, to, to start to build relationships with people that are in all sorts of other typologies that are typically not residential, mm -hmm. though you can definitely find uh, residential clients oh, through yeah. a place like LinkedIn as well. Yes. Um, and, and so I, I guess there's there's a there's a distinction there, right? Between mm -hmm. between the the place where you're going to, it's almost like if if they were actually physical spaces, they would be um, they would look and feel very different. Uh, yeah. And, and and how what you're saying matters at that point. The the messaging, the way you talk about the value that you provide, would be ultimately very different across these different channels. These different channels, yeah. And and it's um. Like you were saying about LinkedIn, you know, because it's a, a much more business oriented platform, it's a natural place to go there um, to find those non-commercial, I mean, non-residential projects um, to make those connections that lead to those projects. Um, but if you are a residential architect, LinkedIn is still great because if your ideal client is, you know, a high tier earner is a CEO, or CIO, like somewhere in the C-suite, then they're gonna be on LinkedIn too. So, hmm. you know, and you can make those personal connections that way. It just, you just really have to know who your people are. You have to be able to, you might've have, might have heard of, um, you know, uh, personas yeah. and, and things like that. And great tool. Yeah, it's it's great because if you take it seriously and really like sit down and can, can you can can you unpack that a little bit like a persona? Oh yeah, persona. And... So basically, it's a way it's it's a way it's a tool to help you focus your marketing messages and mm -hmm. you take the idea. So instead of it being this wide group of of people like you know an age range like twenty four to thirty five and you know they've have two post-grad degrees and you know something it's really specific you narrow it down to a person um mm -hmm. that's going to represent your target market and so you give them a name you find a photo so that they have a, a look they have a face um you you know put in where they live like all the typical demographics where they live how much money they make if they're married or divorced or single 
if they have kids or not and if they do have kids are they young are they college age or you know you should be able to see this person Mm. like it should feel like a real person and then um not just the demographics but also the psychographics so you know where are they in life like are they stuck in a job that they hate Mm. are they looking to transition to something else are they about to do a big move across the country to where you are, where you practice, something like that? Or um, what what magazines do they prefer to read? Where do they hang out in, in real life, not just online? Mm. But, you know, um, the more of this data and sometimes you have to make it up, you, won't, you mm. might not know. And so you're like, well, I think this person would be, you know, they would love, um, you know, Froyo or something and hate coffee and, you know, like, but as best as you can and you can base it if you have a client that you would love to clone Hmm. a way of cheating this process is is describing that client um so you can find more of them but basically your persona this document should become like a person to you so you really know who they are in and out and you know um what their fears are you know um what motivates them um, what their passions in life are, and how they talk. So um, once you have a good idea about who this person is and where they hang out, I mean, right now it's a little, <laughs> the pandemic's in a way, but I mean, you could Everyone's go to a place. Yeah. That's easy. But, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's For at the home. Most part so, of them, yeah. But, um, but you can go online and just listen. So if, if in, and you know, you can join some of the groups that they're probably a part of, um, and just see what they're talking about. And you can um, take some of that as data to put in this persona document. So when you are creating marketing messages to target these people or people like this persona person that you've created, you can use their own language. Hmm. Um, and so it's a, it's, it seems as a process that seems easier than it may be but it's definitely worth the time and effort um, to do so. And again, just like just like being really clear on your own mission mm-hmm. uh, as a firm, if you're really clear on who your ideal clients are, and you can have different personas. Like if, if you work in multiple markets, you can have a persona for each market. But, um, but once you have that, it's so much easier to, to find them and to, and to interact with them online and to attract them to um your your company your firm yeah it's also really important that this is that is it's a living document uh mm-hmm. in the sense that you know as you talk to more people that evolves right you get more informed as to like what well maybe it wasn't really clear when i told them that i you know as an architect i do a certain type of project or whatnot like you start to clarify your messaging so that you really understand more specifically what pain points are they facing and right what I like about this idea of the persona in general too, is when you, when you step back and you think about, as you were mentioning, psychographics, like how, what their, what their mood is, what, what kind of challenges even make them think about hiring an architect, right? You can map mm-hmm. out almost like a workflow chart that just goes all the way to the beginning. Um, yep. And like an example I like to use is um, uh, let's say you're just a simple residential project. Um, mm-hmm you might start with a family as your person. It doesn't always have to be just an individual. It could even be a, a group of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you could say something like, okay, when, when does, what is the, the event that might trigger there to even be the thought of hiring an architect? Well, it could be right. that someone wants to, needs to relocate for a new job. It could be that they um, are expanding their family, right? Mm-hmm. Either adopting or having a, having a baby. And so, um, those then trigger a whole series of events that ultimately lead to them hiring an architect. And sometimes right. what there is a gap, and I'd love to your thoughts on this too, I hope is like, it seems like there's always a gap between um, the amount of content available to help someone mm-hmm. be informed about that journey they're about to take, mm-hmm. even before they get to an architect. As, as yeah. an example in that, in that story, right? Of like ha- having, a, expanding the family, it might be that the first thing you're thinking of when you decide to then, let's say, build a new house is, well, how do I even go about that? Right. And so the first question someone will put in Google is like, how do I go about the pro- you know, finding building a house? Mm-hmm. And 
typically the, the content that's there for that kind of, to answer that question um, is not written by architects. They're written yeah. by other people, brokers, mm -hmm. uh, people that are maybe a step above you or above the firm in that kind of decision-making process. But by no means does it mean that an architect can't, a firm can't have content to answer those questions. And oh, yeah. the more helpful you are, and you could probably, as I'm talking, people uh, you know attending could probably resonate with that in their mind about their own search behavior when they're, when they're trying to find answers. Like you end up trusting those people that help you along the way, right? right. It, they might not come to you immediately because they don't, they don't know you. They just want to be educated and informed. They don't have the intent to actually like um, sign up with someone. But if you're the person or the firm that's actually like giving them that information along the way, mm -hmm. it's very likely they're, they're gonna, you're going to build respect and trust and they're just going to be like, well, I mean, why don't I just reach out to them? You know, and there might be other sort of challenges about are you in the right city? And I, I, there's actually a question too that we, we'll get to about local expertise in terms of marketing. Mm. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, how, like what have you seen on that front too of like yeah. how to map that out and how, how has that been effective? It's definitely helpful to map that out just for your own purposes, like internally, um, not just your own client journey. So that's that happens, you know, once you sign with someone, um, but that lead up to that point, um, especially because content marketing, um, you know, another part of online marketing is a major driver of, of traffic to your website. Um, when you are producing content, you don't want to just like make articles for the sake of making articles, but what you do create needs to be helpful and, and valuable in some way. And that's one way to do it is think about, okay, if someone's moving to this area, like if you live, um, for example, if you live in the Bay Area and you've got people moving there and you know they're going to need to get themselves situated. And what what does that mean? Like it might not, you might not even be talking about um, buying a home at that point. It might just be like, hey, like you're new to the city or you're new to the area. Um, these are some things you should know like about, you know, about this place. And, um, you know, once you have your bearings, like, you know, uh, you might start looking for um, an apartment or maybe instead of an apartment, you should actually think about, you know, finding a home that you can renovate and mm -hmm. maybe there's value. So maybe there's a value proposition in that. So it's like, you know, that they're going to be thinking, okay, now I'm here. I've been here for a little bit. I'm going to move out of this company housing. I want my own place. It's kind of pricey. I don't know. Maybe I should look for an apartment or is it, should I invest in property? And if I do that, what should I do? Those are all questions that you can answer. Um, and then since, and you're the local expert because you're firm there, you, you practice there. Um, but by providing that value and answering all of these questions that pop up that don't seem directly connected, like none of, none of these um, articles would be saying, hire us now. Mm -hmm. You're just giving information that you know they need. So you're building up that what's called know, like, and trust. So they're getting to mm. know you as a company. Um, the, the information that they find that you give out um, is valuable. It's helpful to them. So they start to trust you and it just builds up over time. So when they're like, oh, you know what? I think we're going to invest in a property. They're going to go to you <laughs> because yeah. you've been so helpful this whole time. They will start with you first. Um, and also what's great about that process is that it's often um, the key to uh, circumventing any type of um, price comparison. Like mm -hmm. you, you get even, it doesn't matter really what, That's great, yeah. what a budget yeah. is or what someone can technically afford to invest um, because a lot of people don't really understand what architects do and the value of architects, their instinct is to say, well, you know, this, this firm quoted me this much. And they're not, they don't right. understand why you might be quoting something higher. Um, and you can tell them, oh, well, you know, I'm doing all these other things, but it doesn't mean much to them because they just don't know. They haven't started the process. So it will become clear once they're working with you, but before they start working with you, you have to, they have to feel, mm you know, that connection with you to know that the amount that they're investing in working with you 
is valuable like it's mm. and you can totally get around that whole conversation of you know it's like oh well, i don't know <laughs> yeah, it's no. a little you know and there's also that education component where i'm sure you know many of our listeners here uh also would resonate with the idea that they get called up by people who don't really know the process and this is a great you know the the content that you put out in in this scenario is really helpful both ways it helps them sort of understand everything but it helps you because now once they're ready to talk to you that the the positioning in some way that you've created along the way is like it, it just makes it such an easier conversation. There's yeah. less questioning about how complicated the process, you made it very clear how complicated the process was. Yeah. Um, as an anecdote, I had a, a, a plumber, I just moved to a new place and I had a plumber come by, um, water spilled everywhere, uh, it, it was leaking. And I was just, at, at some point I kind of was giving up and I, this uh, plumber was gonna send some people to check how bad the situation was I'm like well can I just do it myself like can you just help me and like guide me just tell me like high level what is it that I need to do and I'll go to Home Depot and then uh pretty pretty soon he was on the phone he just started to rattle off the various things that had to get done mm-hmm. and by I don't know two minutes into it he was still t- I was like okay I-, I see I understand this is much more complicated than I'm uh, assuming it is just send your people over and and we'll get a quote or something like that um, and it, and it hit me as, uh, as he was talking, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, mm-hmm. this is, uh, important what he's doing here. Um, but I, I imagine, you know, it's just, well, I, I know that this is like an effective, effective way of getting someone to say yes, right. And mm-hmm. to already be primed to understand the process so that you're spending less time educating in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can be sure that, 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 that conversation you're having early on is well qualified, which is, right. I think is an important, important term yeah. here. Qualifying, um, quali- qualifying your leads is paramount because you don't have time to waste. Like no one, no one has time to waste. Um, and some people, you know, you, the that burden is on you because the people contacting you might not know any better. Like yeah. they might, they might. <laughs> and I and I have seen this. I, I there's lots of stories of clients um, and firms I've worked with where you know, they have had a wonderful conversation with someone. And then it turns out that that person, that lead had a budget of $50,000. And yeah. it's like, what? oh, yeah. yeah. And, and then they didn't know why you couldn't work with them. It's like, well, that's not possible. Like what you want, it's just not possible. Yeah. Um, and you can save yourself a lot of time if you have a way of vetting people before it gets, you know, before you're, you're investing too much of your time with them. Um, one way is the content that you put out. Um, because even if someone uh, aligns with your firm's messaging, like, you know, they totally get behind it. They would love to work with you when they're ready to hire an architect. Um, they might, they, they just might not have the money. They might have the budget. It just might not be possible, but they still mm. like you um, and they love your work. They can become your biggest fan and they could become a great, a source of great referrals. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's still worthwhile, but the thing is, you know, you, the content that you put out and also the, um, you can, you can set up your website as well to kind of be like to do this filtering process for mm. you. So that um, if you do have these people that are very excited and they love you and they've been following you on, on social media, but they just, they're not ideal for you because they just can't afford you. Um, you know, they can find that out before talking to you about a project and then finding out that they're way, you know, it, it's just your way out of their yeah. league in terms of budget. Um, and you don't, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do that as much. It's just, um, they will come to that conclusion and be like, oh, I'm not ready to hire them yet. Yeah, and, and even then that's still a, an opportunity for the firm to put their best foot forward. They could offer you know, uh, a referral to somebody else that might be able to help them. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's uh, at that scale, it's just directly to uh, a contractor that they might know that, that can mm-hmm. help them kind of end to end or even just, 
like preparing for that scenario, if that's one that's very common in that market um, and having maybe a, a smaller, easier uh, design package, right? That's already yeah. kind of pre-configured. Here's some styles you can pick from. Like the burden on the firm is much less because they have a process for it that can really uh, lower cost effectively, mm -hmm. right? It's like you use those moments as a way to kind of learn ultimately again. And, and that informs, you know, if it just happens that, wow, we just keep attracting people that their budgets don't really fit into our into our normal scope of work that we're like, we would like to work in. Well, maybe that's actually something to think about and consider. Mm -hmm. Like if you're able to easily attract it, then how can you provide better services mm -hmm. for them and, and just rethink your operations to meet that? Um, yeah. There are definitely firms, especially res residential firms that have great success with that idea um, by just offering um, and being flexible with what they offer. So they're not going to overburden themselves or um, do, do more work for yeah. no money, but they're still able to um, solve a problem for this client. And so it can, and it can take, it really depends on on you know the project and what you do and your but there's different ways you can do that where you can create these little packages and you know it's a way for you to satisfy that need and have a, a great experience for someone um, especially if it's their first time working with an architect uh, so that they feel satisfied they got something that they needed within the budget that they happen to have to work with um, it might not be you know an all-star project that you would just put everywhere on your website, but you um, were able to help people mm. that, you know, that need your service. And they, and, and if there's that, that um, connection where, you know, you really like these people and they really like your firm, then, you know, if there's a way to do that without sacrificing um, uh your own, like sacrificing your firm, like you don't have to mm. take on work that you, don't want to do or that you you know you want you want to get paid for and not un and be underpaid so um it really depends on your process um just your design process but usually there's a point in the process where you can kind of make that the cutoff and everything that came up to that point is a package and you can yeah. put like a, a, a price on that and so for people that, you know, and, and it, it doesn't have to be a flat fee because it, again, it depends on your process, depends on what's in that package, but it can still be a smaller percentage fee than what they would have had if they did full end-to-end -end right. services right. with you. Yep. So it's definitely a, a, it's a, it's a way to be successful in a market that maybe, um, you know, the majority of that market is, has like a budget that's a little too small for you. Ideally. Hmm. So let, let's flip the, 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 the script on that then for budgets, right? Like since you brought it up, uh, how should firms think about their marketing budget? Yeah. Okay. So your marketing budget. Um, first off, you should think of marketing as an investment. It's not an expense. Um, it's like marketing and business development is what like drives the projects. That, that's what brings in the money. So that's an investment. The more you can invest into that, the better off your firm will be. Um, however, if you don't know what you should be budgeting, um, you should think to, okay, well, are you profitable as a firm? And if you're not sure, that's, that's the problem you need to solve first. You need to make sure um, that the numbers are good. You need to know what's going on in your firm. You need to know, um, you know how much um, billable versus non-billable hours that you and your team are putting in. And you need to know it precisely. You need to track it. Um, if you don't track it, you're, it's just not gonna work. Because <laughs> the thing yeah. is, you will be surprised. You'll think, oh, well, we've been spending this much time on, you know, on um, this part of the project. We've been spending this much time on, you know, this other thing, this other task. But if you're actually tracking it, I guarantee you, you're, you'll be shocked at the, at the difference and what you thought it was. But if you actually are tracking those hours and you know how much is billable and how much is non-billable, then you can look and see like, okay, well, is that ratio okay? Like, if, am I, you know, 
spending or is my team spending uh, too much time on billable hours? Because that's something that can be pretty common, um, especially if it if your time isn't really tracked and mm. and time tracking. Uh, it really as annoying as it could be. I mean, like if there's a lot of tools that make it <laughs> not annoying or less annoying, but if you know to the hour or even to the half hour, but at least to the hour of what's being spent where, and you can see at a glance, like, oh, we're spending way too much time. And now, but like, what is, what is, you can pinpoint any issues, you can correct those issues. Um, but if you do have that data and you have been tracking your time, um, your firm's time, then you have an idea about, okay, well, it looks like, you know, we're making this much money we have this much in overhead. Um, that gives you an idea about how much uh, space you have in terms of, um, you know, what cash is available for investing in, you know, different business opportunities or in your marketing. Mm. And so you would take that, like once you have those numbers firm, you would take that and um, kind of like earmark that as these are our marketing business development dollars. And, um, and then <laughs> once you kind of have like a general budget, you know how much money you've kind of sucked away for solely marketing business development um, activities, then you can look at what you've been doing. So, I mean, right now we're, we're in the last quarter of the year, but if you're looking ahead to 2021, you want to look back through this year um, and even the year before, it, it really depends on your firm, but at the very least look back at the previous year and, you know, how many projects were, um, you know, did hmm. you close on? Like what, how much money was brought in? Um, and what were you doing for marketing? What was bringing in those projects? And were they the type of projects that you really want to do? Or was it just something you accepted because you need the cash flow? Like, you know, we have to get straight on all of that. But once you know um, what your return was on whatever you did the prior year, you can make some decisions on what you want to do going ahead. So maybe you want to bring in more work, but not just um, more of the same. Maybe you want to try a different market. Maybe mm. you had one project that was amazing. It was a public sector project. It was a really great experience. You want to bring in more of that kind of work. Then you need to be able to make uh, some adjustments to getting more of those, those projects. Right, right. And, like a um, retrospective, yeah. Like, can yeah. you like basically going back and and surveying all the things that worked, all the things that didn't work, and seeing how you can make make improvements for the next year. Yeah. Um. But I mean, you've also there's there's also some things that are kind of interesting, like in 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 uh, especially in in the world of um, technology, yeah. and uh, or even like more productized companies where you have this notion of a lifetime value or LTV, for short. Uh, in mm -hmm. short. Which is basically to suggest that like there are some um, there are some expected lifetime uh, amount of, of potential revenue from a certain size company or whatnot, mm -hmm. um, and and that that's really helpful when you're thinking about who your potential client is. As as we know, I think it's a, this. I forgot the, the the statistic, but I think it's about seventy percent of most architecture firm work is repeat uh, re, repeat uh, clients. Repeat clients. Yeah. Um, that that's important, right? Because that actually means that your initial investment is somewhat amortized over the the amount of projects that you end up getting with that one client. And if, let's say, we use back our example of that um, family, right, looking to expand into a new house, it might be that you would say, okay, I want to make sure that it's within, uh, let's say, thirty percent or a fifty percent margin uh, of our gross margin on this on this project. We want to allocate that towards marketing. Um, and let's say that's, or that's how much it costs to actually bring this customer in mm -hmm. or the client, the client in, um, you can at least say, okay, well, versus the ratio between that and this project is maybe, uh, and, and how much money you can get out of this part is probably significant. I mean, if it's only a certain percentage of a margin, that's really good. Mm -hmm. Essentially you can, uh, you will, your, your investment is, is, is so, somewhat crazy. And so the way to think about it is like, how, how big is the potential project size mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And how much are you be, or can you sustainably spend to get that type of project? And then you playbook that or you figure out a way to repeat that process. So then you mm-hmm. have a benchmark to say, okay, it was $1,000 to get a client that actually was $500,000 project or, or whatever that net, net fee ends up being. Um, that's really good. You know, yeah. I mean, you might think of it as like a thousand dollars, that's a lot, but, but essentially that means that gives you so much opportunity to spend from a marketing perspective. That means mm-hmm. you can probably invest more in LinkedIn ads, right. Which are actually mm-hmm. much more expensive than some other channels. Like, and, and so it's like in that retrospective, you also have the opportunity to understand on a project by project basis, what, what was the persona of that project or what mm-hmm. was, um, uh, in general, the scope of work and how can we then get more of that? But to, to understand that, you, know, just, you need to understand how did we bring them in? Exactly. Um, and, and I know we had talked a little bit about um, um, this this idea of like, how do you create a process in general, mm-hmm. right? Because marketing is only the beginning, right? That's just right. to attract people to, to understand who you are, build brand awareness. At some point, you know, they either email you or they call you or, or, you know, DM you on Instagram. Um, what happens then after that? Like, right. what is the process that companies should put in place? Right. So um, one layer, like one part of the beginning of this, of this process, um, when someone reaches out to you is the filtering layer or the vetting process, um, because you need to make sure that they you know, not, not only are they the right client, um, cause maybe they are, but it's not the right time, but you need to make sure that they have their ducks in a row. So one way you can do that is, um, have some type of, uh, you can have like a form on your website. So people need to kind of fill out this form and, um, and the process of the thing is like the, a lot of times, uh, the, the general wisdom for forms on websites is to have as few fields as possible, like name, email, maybe phone number, maybe something else, because it's um, it's a barrier. The more fields you have to fill out, the less likely someone's gonna actually like fill yeah. out. Yeah. But on the other hand, the more fields you have for someone to fill out, the people that actually fill out everything are more serious than the people that don't. That's true, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but within that, um, that form and maybe it's not the maybe it can be just on your contact page it could be like a a page that um you know people get sent a link to i don't it it really depends on how you implement it but you have some type of form that has all of the ask the ask all of the questions that you would be asking if you were talking to them on the phone trying to see if it's a good fit but it's in this form. So you don't have to do the asking. And what usually happens is as, as someone's filling out this form, either they're not that, they can't be that bothered because they're not that serious. So they're gonna stop. For the people that continue, um, based on the types of questions you're posing, um, they will get a sense of if it's the right fit Mm. for them. So whether that means budget wise, whether that means, you know, um the the type of project that they have in mind because as they're filling something out like if they have in their head i want a custom home for 60 grand and they're filling out this form and you're just like oh so what's your budget and you give them a few big um you know big buckets of 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 options but none of them (laughs) it's 60 grand that will tell them oh maybe my budget's actually a little too low um and that can they can rethink that um you know, if it's, if you have um, questions about, um, you know, timing, like, are you looking to start this project in the next few weeks, in the next few months, in the next few years? Um, yeah, not critical. only does that give you an idea about where their head is, but that makes, it makes sure that they've thought about it. It's not just like, I you know I want to build a house and I've saw this plot of land. Let me like reach out to an architect. They have to think about the answers to these questions. Um, right. So that will help weed out a lot of people that you will have wasted time on the phone with. Um, but even then, some people can slip through the cracks. So that's one layer. And then um, for people that do fill out that form, um, you could have, depending on what's in your form, it might make sense 
for you to have another layer that's automated. So they fill out this form, it, you know, they get a response back. Um, so, you know, they feel like they have your attention, that they, they've been seen and heard, um, and that you're going to do something with this data that they gave you. Um, it could be an automated thing. So maybe based on the answers in the form, they get a message saying like, oh, you know, this would be great, but it's not the right time or, you know, whatever it is, is your message is saying like, no, is this not right? Um, and if, depending on what they put in that form, it could shoot off a different one. It's like, oh, someone will be reaching out to you. Can you confirm this is the best number for you? And that sort of thing. Um, just to kind of further help vet the people that you will actually be talking to. And, um, and you can, you can have another layer. So like that email that gets sent that says, hey, you know, like someone's gonna reach out. Can you answer a few more questions? It's really gonna help us, you know, spend our time on the phone with you wisely if we know the answers to these questions. So that's yeah. a little more data, yeah. <laughs> you know, but in the, in the more of this that you have, um, the better it will be for you because you'll know um, if it's worthwhile pursuing. Right. And, you know, if you if that means you can save some time then that's some money that's saved um but also that means you have more attention that you can put onto those um leads that seem to you know that pass that vetting process it's like okay you've got more time to spend with them because mm -hmm. um, the idea is that that's going to pay off because they will sign with you and you will you know get that's your return basically yeah. is, is uh, landing that project what 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 for for the audience what what tools what tool would you recommend that really helps? Because you mentioned a lot of automation. It seems like a complex automation, depending on answers. What have it, you seen that works? It can be. Um, I mean, the setup. I mean, the setup can take a little while, but once it's set up and running, you don't really have to worry about it too much. Um, but yeah, so there's a few different things um, for uh, for automation sequences, um, a great tool is Active Campaign. They have some really, um, really fun and advanced um, and easy to set up if you're a newbie to that whole world. It's pretty easy to kind of get going um, with their automation sequences. And Active Campaign is a whole email marketing CRM mm. suite. That's automations is just one part of what they offer, um, but that's one. Um, the other is HubSpot. Um, yep, if you pay for the uh, one of their paid um, hubs, like Sales Hub, Marketing Hub, they have these different um, tiers. Uh, they have tremendously powerful tools to help you um, create these types of automations. And um, that's definitely something that's worth an investment into. Um, the other thing would be using something like um, you could use something like maybe MailChimp or um, like I wouldn't, not MailChimp by itself, but that's just not powerful enough, but like MailChimp plus Zapier or Zapier plus, um, plus HelpSpot. Like if you don't want to pay for HelpSpot, you can use their free CRM. Um, Zapier is a tool that's kind of like the connector of tools. It, it, it integrates with almost any tool. And awesome. um, yeah. you can tell, you can tell it like, okay, when this thing happens, send that data over to this other tool. And then when this other thing happens, send it. So, and once you set up, and it's really easy. What I like about Zapier is that, and there's a lot of similar tools, but it's really easy to understand if you're new to this whole idea. And, um, and because they integrate with so many different tools that you probably already use or are thinking about using, um, it's just a, a great way to go. Um, but yeah, you can, you can have all of this set up to just run in the background. So you don't have to do anything manually until you get on the phone with the client or the would-be client. Yeah, see, I have to test the Zapier. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome. I mean, the kind of complicated workflows because some, not every tool does the best job. And so uh, at a very specific thing, and so Zapier allows you to connect a lot of different tools together to design a workflow that works for, for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we, we're big fans of, of uh, Zapier here at Monograph. And HubSpot is also one of our, uh, it's, it's our CRM of choice. Um, it, it's really powerful, both in just being able to kind of manage like conversations and help you keep track mm -hmm. of things, 
but also when it comes to the marketing side, our newsletters run through through HubSpot and it's it's really great to be able to understand, okay, like, you know, what what resonated, what didn't resonate with people in our newsletter, mm-hmm. what content did they like, what didn't they like, how many people unsubscribe, because that's, you know, reality and some people just don't want uh, um, to get our, our amazing newsletter in their, in their email. <laughs> they lost. <laughs> and that's great. It's fine. Um, but, um, but yeah, so yeah, those are really, really great um, uh, tips. Um, hope. So I just want to, we have a little bit of time left. I just want to kind of open it up to people. If anyone has any questions, um, I know there's actually one here that we haven't really addressed, but I'm very curious is uh, actually if, if someone wants to, I might even let someone chime in if someone wants to talk. I haven't done that actually yet. Anyone? anyone? Hi, Lucas. <laughs> Hi, Lucas. How's it going? Um, Okay, so there is one question. What was, uh, the, sorry, uh, is local expertise important when finding a marketing firm or consultant? Mm. Um, not necessarily. It depends on the work history of that consultant or firm. Do they typically work? Um, like if you're thinking within the US, do they have clients all over the US? Because if they do, and, they, and those are clients that that are longtime clients, or at least like they have a very successful reputation, then they are used to adapting to the needs um, that a firm would need, like would have in their region, in their area. Um, there is a benefit. So if you are working with someone local, um, especially if you are a firm that is only like you're only working um, within one state, like you, you don't have licenses in other states and you're not doing working on projects in other states, then there is a, an advantage because you don't have to have those conversations explaining something that's super hyper local. Like maybe there's an, a sort of event or there's, you know, or there's um, uh, just a part of just civic life that is only known to people that live in that one location, you would have to, I mean, it's not a big deal, but you would have to explain that and kind of have a conversation. Is that something that we should incorporate into our marketing somehow? Like, you know, that becomes part of the conversation, but um, it's not a requirement, but you do need to, and part of your due diligence is to find out, you know, where most of their clients are located. Because if they seem to have you know, a few firms here and a few firms there, but the majority are in their own location, then it's not, it's not a deal breaker, but I would be a little wary. I would, I would have more questions before moving forward with that firm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it depends also on the kind of campaigns you're looking to run or just your strategy, right? Like digital, not really necessary to, to have a, a, a local marketing consultant. There's a lot of um, you know, your work is, is definitely yeah, an like example I, of that. I, yeah, I, I have clients all over the place and I'm in New York. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and that's also the, you know, the amazing uh, benefit of today, right, is that you don't, you can, with these different channels, you can build audiences from all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't even have to be um, centered around your, your city. And I think, uh, you know, uh, I'd love to bring you on again to maybe even do a deeper dive into a specific channel like Instagram or LinkedIn. I think oh, that'd yeah. be really great. Um, let's see, any, Guillaume seems to really have enjoyed the talk. That's great. Oh, awesome. Um, any other questions? Cool. Okay, so I think I'm gonna, I have a couple of questions um, for you as sort of our kind of little lightning round. Um, this one's a good one. What, what, can you tell us what's the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? Hmm. Wow, let's see. Um, I think I've been lucky in that I've had quite a lot of nice things happen for me. Um, so is there, is there a context? Like, is this within business or personal or just anything? Open? We've had some personal answers here. It's okay. Great. It's a, oh, wow. Um, it's always a nice kind of way to just I think, I think it would have to be, ooh, I'm, I'm, I have a tie right now in my head. I'm trying to see what's the tiebreaker. I think it's, I'm going to, I'm going to say um, my uncle, well, one of my many uncles, um, because of his comment when I was a very small child is what 
led me on a path of architecture. And I honestly have no idea <laughs> what I'd be, like, even though I'm not practicing architecture right now, like, I don't know what my life would be like, what I'd be doing if I didn't glom onto that at such a young age and, and go in that direction. Um, and it's been really rewarding. Like, even, even though I don't practice architecture right now, like, it's my world. <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I really owe it all to that one conversation. That's amazing. It actually uh, gave me chills because I have a very similar story. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I also don't necessarily practice architecture, but I'm uh, studied it, and, and it was very similar. An uncle of mine also was someone who sort of it's those planted. uncles. Yeah, it's those uncles. Yeah, <laughs> uh, find the seed. Um, so, okay. So I just want to kind of roll the red carpet off for you, and just let everyone know what it is that you're kind of working on. How can people get in contact with you if they want to reach out? Cool. Okay. Well, um, you can reach me through um, my website or any of my social media platforms. My website is hopeworksdesign.com. Um, I can put it in a little chat here. Awesome. So you don't have to try and type it in yourself. Um, and all of my social media handles are Hopeworks Design. So that would be Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter as well, but not so much. But if you tweet at me, I will, I will respond. <laughs> we can have a little conversation on Twitter. Um, but yeah, um, definitely connect with me. Um, reach out if you have other questions. Uh, if you go to my website, I do um, offer a free uh, clarity, what I call a clarity call. So it's really open and it's whatever marketing questions you happen to have and you want some quick answers on, just book a time and we'll spend 15, 20 minutes, you know, diving into that question, getting it clear for you and send you on your way. <laughs> So thank you so much. I, I just want to let everyone know too, uh, uh, if, uh, if you're interested in this webinar, we actually have a couple more people coming up. Um, we have, which is, it's great that we have a, a calendar so robust now, but uh, we have, uh, next week we have Matthew Keishan from ZGF Architects, well-known uh, firm that works on uh, most, a lot of hospitals. Um, and he's he's uh, leading up comms there, and so that's going to be a really interesting conversation to see what kind of marketing and communications looks like at that at, at a firm of that scale. We also have Lisa Mendez from Shop Architects, uh, who's going to be joining us to talk about project management, what it's been like to lead um, uh, global projects. So it's kind of different different uh, scale at that point, but really really excited about it. And then um, in November we have also our quarterly product update. Uh, our sort of a new in monograph series. And we also have Tiffany Rafi from Upspring PR to talk about all things PR uh, in uh, mid-November. So really excited for everyone to join us for those. Um, feel free to tell everyone how excited you were about this webinar and uh, share it. We do, we will follow up with an email um, that has a Q and A, but sort of a, a form uh, to ask questions about you know, what have you enjoyed from the webinar? How can we make it better? What kind of ideas you have? Really excited to hear that. And we also have a YouTube channel uh, for Monograph that you can, uh, will be in, in the YouTube video that we send out. Uh, feel free to subscribe to that um, so you can keep up to date for any, any other content that we have. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining and see you next week. Yep, thanks. Thanks, Hope. Bye.